Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, wait a second. I'm, uh, thank you, everybody, I should say. It's not politically correct to say anymore, ladies and gentlemen, as you know. Uh, you know that? Yeah, OK. Uh, the evening we will have here is very, very simple. The formula is very, very simple. Um, Susan will read selections from the book. Then Peter and I will talk about them, debate them, agree with them, disagree with them. Then, after a few minutes, Susan will read another two selections, and then we'll talk about the debate, agree or disagree, and then Susan will read the final section. And after that, we'll talk a little bit about it. And then, of course, the most exciting part of the evening, as always, should be, hopefully will be, is you, girls and boys. We open it for Q&A, and you talk, and address whoever you want, and be free and lively, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, we start right now, Suzanne. QV and JVP. A few months ago, I was invited by a member of a group calling itself QV to join their next yearly conference, or summit, as they call it, which is to start later today in DC. QFI, which stands for Christians United for Israel, is headed by a famous American pastor, John Hagee, and a couple of Jews. Yeah, there are two Jews at the top of this organization, and they are the ones who actually run it, but nobody likes to talk about this, so I won't either. Looking at the people gathered here, my assumption is that at least one third of them are Jewish. It's quite easy, I think, to figure this out. When the words Holy Spirit are uttered on the stage, fewer than half of the people clap. When something like Support Israel is mentioned, almost all clap. Between sessions, many people go out to eat at their favorite restaurants, and everybody seems happy. The happiest here are the Jews, who have come to this conference for one purpose, to see non-Jews love them. How do I know? They tell me. It's sad to watch their need to be loved. Toward the evening, at about five, some demonstrators appear in front of the convention center. They are about 20 altogether, white people with big Palestinian flags and signs such as, End the Occupation. They are part of the group Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP a far-left Jewish organization associated with Professor Noam Chomsky and playwrights Eve Ensler and Tony Kushner. Nobody is paying them any attention, which is something that these American Jews don't like, and so they start screaming at the people who are entering or leaving the building. It's a Jew versus Christian show in the funniest way imaginable. One of them trying to poke fun at Christians is a bit overdoing it. God loves the Palestinians, he shouts, but not even an echo answers him. As the media piles out, these demonstrators get out their loudspeakers and make even louder noise. I watch all this while writing on my iPad. Jonathan, one of the demonstrators, sees me writing and assumes that I'm part of the media. He tries talking to me, but I don't reply. He tries again, but I still don't react. He tries one more time and fails again. He's getting upset, and he tells me that I'm an ugly man with fat fingers. In case I didn't get the message, he goes on. You are pissing from your shoulders. You make me lose my appetite, you fucking filthy Jew. Your fat fingers will break your iPad. Don't you worry about that, fucking Jew. Now he got me, definitely. Would you like to say this on record? I ask him. Yes. I turn the video on and he changes his tune and tone. He loves all people, he now says calmly, and he wants a free Palestine. I protest. I want you to repeat what you just said to me, I say to him. You know, that I'm an ugly Jew and the rest. He denies he said it. So I repeat his words while the video goes on. He realizes that this might not sound good, and he says, you're weird. 
I turn off the video, and he goes at me. Fuck you, Jew, you sleazy Jew. I light up a cigarette, and immediately security people tell me to move away. Rabid racism is okay, but smoking is not. St. Paul. In good time and with excellent weather, I reach St. Paul, Minnesota. Nice name for a city, don't you think? Of course, when I hear saints, I immediately think of Jews, the folks who gave St. Paul to the world. I find myself in a sizable Jewish temple. Today, it turns out, they have a lecture training session about race and racism which I assume is about anti-Semitism, given that they are Jews. The event is organized, I learn, by the Jewish Community Action in St. Paul. Good to know that the Jews here are active. About 70 people attend, two of whom wear skull caps. The attendees sit around tables that are spread around the room, and I join one of them. The Jews seem deeply worried. I didn't even see sad faces like these in any of the hoods. What happened? I don't know. What I do know is this. On each table, there are numerous envelopes for use by those seated around the table who would like to stuff money into them. Starting amount suggested? $54. No problem. The first speaker, a young lady, goes to the podium. She speaks about our system, referring to the American justice system, and says that it is stacked against blacks. This event, I quickly realize, is not about anti-Semitism, but white racism. The Jews here, I slowly find out, feel guilty about the white guy who, some months ago, killed nine blacks at the black church in South Carolina. No, Dylan Roof isn't Jewish, but he is white, and these Jews feel responsible. Why? Ask them. Time passes slowly, and then a black lady comes to the podium. American Jews, I have found long ago, love to have at least one black person at their event. They've got one here, a good one. She's not just black, but also Jew by choice black, as she introduces herself, which means that she is a convert. She is, in other words, a black lady who fell in love with Jews. Well, not exactly. She has a big problem with Jews, she tells the audience. American Jews, she has discovered since becoming Jewish, are racist, and she wants all Jews present to know that she has blown their cover. As if this is not enough, she adds that racism also exists within the Israeli Jewish community. Ethiopians in Israel, she says, are 2% of the population, but 30% of them have a police record. Who's to blame? Everybody in Israel, including the Israeli government. Israel publicly invited French Jews to come to Israel, she says, but will not do the same for black Jews. She, of course, neglects to mention that Israel sent planes to Africa to bring black Jews to Israel, and that's how the Ethiopians are in Israel to start with. But this is a minor detail, too minor to mention. When she is done with accusing the Jews, the Jews present here applaud her. Don't ask me to explain. Next on the agenda is the training part, where people learn how to talk to each other about race. Two people from the audience go to the podium and practice talking about race. It goes something like this. One person says, wow, this is, wow, this is, and the other person replies, yeah, right, yeah, so true. Who is the dumbhead who said that Jews are smart? Once the event is over, I sit down with the executive director of the Jewish Community Action, a guy by the name of Vic Rosenthal, and ask him, do you think that somewhere out there, blacks sit together and discuss how to help Jews against anti-Semitism, just as you are doing about them? No. Does that bother you? No. 
If I'm not mistaken, Jews have done more than any other group in America to help blacks in the 50s and the 60s and ever since. Yet blacks do not reciprocate, and you're okay with it. How come? We have not done enough. Maybe we did more than other communities in America, but I expect Jews to do more. Why should Jews do more than any other group? The answer that I get, a long one, could be summed up with one word, because. To me, the very idea that Jews should do more than others is by itself racist, but I don't think I should say such a thing in a temple. I also meet Peggy, who is actually Lutheran. Why is she here? I wanted to see how the Jews deal with racial issues in our country and perhaps do the same in our church. What did you learn? I was very surprised to learn that the Jews are also racist against the black Jews. I didn't know that. A good lesson to share with her fellow Lutheran churchgoers. Next to Peggy is a Jewish lady by the name of Judy. Judy tells me that she works for peace between people and that she fights prejudice against any group whatsoever. Judy also thinks that Jews are racist, but this is not a prejudice. Why not? I was in Israel and I saw there that all the street sweepers in Israel are Ethiopian and that Jews treat Arabs very, very badly. The church lady is learning a lot today about Jews. Outside the temple, I meet a nice gay guy. He tells me he's gay, not that I asked him. And he tells me that the Jews got it all wrong. I don't know what kind of metrics they're using, but their conclusions are not correct. Blacks in Minnesota are doing fine. Not just fine, they're doing great. The biggest Somali settlement in the world after Somalia is Minneapolis. This is a piece of interesting news. After all the racism that I've seen so far, I now discover that it all stops at the borders of the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Susan. Okay, the reason I have chosen this, can you hear me? The reason I have chosen this too to start with it has to do about some of my experiences many times when speaking with people who identify themselves as uh, progressive liberals. Uh, God knows what it is, what it means, but... Um, and what is interesting about them, and, and I find it lovely, is that they know how to talk. They talk very, very nicely. They are very well dressed. Progressive, and they are not dressed like me. I mean, I'm a schlepper schmuck, you know, it's like we told this belly. And the, the, the liberals are dressed much nicer, they talk nicer, they're, they're all... But what happens if you disagree with them? What happens if you argue with them? When you argue with them, they become like animals. This is my experience. And that was the experience with Jewish Voice for Peace in the beginning, because Jonathan is a nice guy. Jonathan can talk very nicely and very, very sweetly. But then he... Boom, he explodes, and very, very ugly. And the other things that I find out about, about so-called progressive Jews, progressive liberals, in my mind at least, and I am sure that Peter will disagree with me on this, in my mind at least, they, are, they have this sickness of self-hatred. They, they cannot wake up in the morning and not find something else that is bad about Jews. Like this guy I met in Israel, um, it was at the time the, the senior rabbi of uh, rabbis from human, for human rights. I don't know if you heard about it. He's an American Jew, and he moved to Israel with his wife. And, and this is one of the guys that, if he wakes up in the morning and he didn't catch a Jew doing something really, really bad, he, he, he starts fasting and, and, and he goes to, he prays a lot for God to help him find another bad Jew and to advertise it. So this is something that I personally disagree with. Uh, just for the record, I am not, uh, I'm not a progressive liberal. I am not, uh, I am not a conservative. I am not a centrist. I used to be all of them. Um, I started as Haredi, and then I moved on. You know what Haredi is, ultra-Orthodox? Then I moved on to become a, a extreme right-wingers, 
and uh, you know, a settler kind of. And then I moved on to become a, a leftist, um, a real leftist. I love the Shea Olebovic, I love Chulami Taloni. And then this didn't work for me, I saw the airline too, so I became a centrist. And then I realized that a centrist doesn't work for me either. And I realized that to find the truth, you actually, it's not easy. Uh, you have to find it, you have to search for it all the time. So at this point, I believe in facts. Not right wing, not left wing, not anywhere. But since I saw Peter writing, and he's been writing and writing and writing, I'll ask him to share something with us. What have you written over there? What have I written? Yeah, right here. Oh, I was taking notes from the, the conversation so I share can remember. Share with us, share, share with us. Uh, well, the first one was about uh, uh, the, your encounter at, at Jewish Voices for Peace um, with this gentleman named Jonathan, yeah. who sounds like an anti-Semite. Um, uh, um, so, you know, I always find this line about self-hatred to be an interesting one because um, I know a, a lot of Jews who hate some other Jews. Um, that's not unique to the left, by the way, right? I mean, for instance, about a you know, year and a half ago when I was walking with my kids down West End Avenue to Shul, then the guy, the guy who came up to me and said, are you Peter Beinart? He was walking with his kid to Shul too. And I said, yeah. And he said, your politics are shit in front of my kids or his kids. He seemed to have some hatred towards me. But I don't think he had hatred towards himself. I very rarely meet Jews who hate themselves. Uh, I meet Jews who really, really, really hate other Jews. I think that definitely exists. Right, and it's not the province of one ideology or the other. There are people, there are left-wing Jews who this really don't like right-wing Jews, and vice versa. But I've never met actually anyone who said, "You know what? I hate myself." I'll explain it to you, because you need an explanation here. Mm. I guess I'll explain to you. When I say a self-hating Jew, it doesn't mean a Jew that doesn't like good ice cream, mm -hmm. or a Jew who doesn't like a nice car, mm -hmm. or a Jew who doesn't like to enjoy life. That's mm -hmm. wrong. That's mm -hmm. the wrong definition of self-hating mm -hmm. Jew. Self-hating Jews that I'm describing, that I'm talking about, is not a guy who doesn't like to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course he enjoys. Gideon Levy from Haaretz doesn't enjoy life. Of course he enjoys life. He, he enjoy, Amira As from Haaretz that, that doesn't enjoy life. I mean, the Schmeckerle Beckerle from, from J Street, what's his name? Ben Ami doesn't enjoy mm -hmm. life. He has, a, he has a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. He's making tons of money. How do, you know, how do you know he's making tons I, of money? I know. I see. He always asks me for money. No, no, no. no but how do you know he's making tons I of money? I see it. He's always asking no, no, me no. for money. No, no, no. He may ask for donations, but you have no idea whether he's making tons I, of I money. I can see I just have to interrupt because, because some of the things you say have no basis I'll whatsoever in reality. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay, I mean, let's just face that. You don't know You don't know how much he earns. You don't okay, know just how much he earns. You don't know. Look, look. I do, I do that's less than Haram, okay, right? If you want to go personal, I can go personal. I mean, no, no, I'm just saying. Jeffrey Goldberg said about you and about your book. You can say whatever you want. Just a second. Jeffrey Goldberg said about your book, mm. okay, one-sided and filled with errors. That's fine. Okay? We can talk so, about I, my book. No, it's like, so let's not go there. Let's not go personal. No. I'm just saying. But the guy, you talk about I'll, 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 talk answer, about I'll answer you. Yes. He sends me emails every yes. time how much money he made. We just made 20000 We need another 5000 Is that we his salary? Made, I guess he makes money. He's traveling around. He's flying all over. I guess he's not poor. He doesn't live in the neighborhood, in the hood. Put okay. it this way. Okay? But you don't have any he's facts. To, you have no facts uh, to back up uh, that statement. Okay. okay. He makes good living. Come on. Yeah. So, so go. Oh, look, do the work. Look, oh, at, look at the 990. It's okay. His organization, put it this way, is making a lot of money. Okay? Let's go that way. It's his organization, according to him, is making tons of money. They raise money. He, yeah. he makes conference. Okay, they make. That's the like point. every other Jewish organization, the they point. raise that's money. The point. That's the point. I usually I can tell you about Jews. If you are on the top of an organization that makes tons of money, you are not going to be poor. If if Jeremy Ben Ami is the exception, is J Street is making so much money and he doesn't get a the salary, then he's an idiot, which is worse than being poor. Right. My point is, you, you just don't know what you're talking about. That's no, all. no, 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 no. This is the point. No, no. You, but the point is that I'm trying to say, okay, you wanna, uh, Peter, you want to go personal? I'll go personal with you. No, no, I'm just saying. No, no, I'm just saying. No, no, facts, let's talk no, about we facts. Talk about, we talk no, about facts. Guys, that's on topic. Okay, yeah. that's on topic. Exactly, that's on topic. And the point is, when you say about people who are self-hating, its point is what I see in this, you know, in these people is, get the Jew out of me. That's the self-hating. It's like, scratch them. It's, it's, it's like Uncle Tom. It's not something that they came up with. This kind of self hating was all over. Like Roy Cohen. Mm -hmm. You know, Roy Cohen. I mean, we know this story. He was, he was the, the father of all gays. And, and he was like basically persecuting gays, chasing gays. That's called self hatred. 
It's that you can't stand who you are as a Jew, and you are trying to be something else. You are trying to be like the Europeans. You are trying to be like the Lutherans, whatever you are trying to be. You are trying to be like somebody else, and taking that Jew out of you. So, Not, you know, so let's look at the guy. evidence. You, you have this guy, Jonathan. He seems like he might be a good specimen. He seems like he has, he has is ex exhibiting some anti-Semitic behavior. He seems like he's hostile to you because you're a Jew. So let's put him down as number one, right? Okay, but I think you know, if, if we're going to make statements about people, the idea that people act based on hatred of the Jewish people, right, and hatred of Jewishness, which I think is what you're saying, yeah. we, we then need evidence for that, right? Because you, you have to know someone pretty well, right, to know that their motives are, that their motive is hatred of their own people and hatred of the idea of okay. Jewishness, right? I, I'll so, disagree. so let's I'll look disagree. for the evidence. I, just a second. I disagree with you. I don't have to know the person very well personally to know that he hates Jews or hates everything. Uh, if I did, then I could not say that Adolf Hitler hated Jews. I never knew Adolf Hitler personally, and there is no chance that I'm going to meet him. But we have a lot of evidence about what Adolf Hitler, Hitler said and did, well, right? We have evidence. So that, give that, me that, the that, evidence. That's, that's the, okay, that's the evidence that I'm saying to you. Okay. If you say everything negative about Israel, you call Israel the one Jewish state, you know? You call it apartheid state. Mm -hmm. You equate Israeli soldiers with the SS, which you have on the left all the time, over and over and over and over again. But That's who, a problem. But who are you when talking about in out, particular? And I, and I, many of them on the progressive left. Okay, give me an example. Liberals. Give me a name. Is give me a, a quote. J Street is an example. Okay, well, so, BDS, so let's start with BDS. the apart. Let's start. But so just among, say, just say, just say, just uh, a second. Just a second. The problem is that we're, you want to talk about Peter, facts. I'm trying Peter, to actually Peter, get something Peter, I can put my finger Peter, on uh, here. Uh, uh, you'll put your finger on it. The point is like this. I give you an example. I mean, the, the two examples that they get. Okay, forget Jonathan. You go to a shul. You go to a temple. I know they call it shul. You go to a temple. And the only things they say is against Jews. I mean, this Lutheran lady over there finds out, she comes out, and what does she think? The Jews are horrible people. They are racist people. I mean, we Jews had nothing, zero, to do with the church in, 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 you know, the church in Oscar, Emmanuel Church in North Carolina. We had zero South to do with Carolina. it. South Carolina. South Carolina, I'm sorry. Yeah, of course, South Carolina. Uh, we did zero to do with it. I was in the church. It was amazing. Zero to do with it. Nothing. Right. So we are not Mr. Roof. Mr. Roof has never, you know, become, uh, converted to Judaism, even reform. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's, and, and, and we feel guilty about it. And then we sit and we talk. We talk about black, racism against blacks. And then we have to push about, again, Israel. Israel is bad. Israel is bad. Israel is bad. Is, we cannot wake up. In, we cannot. You want to talk about racism against blacks in America? Let's talk about it. Absolutely. But why do we have to mix immediately Israel? Okay, so I think if we are to say that anyone who suggests the possibility of Israel becoming an apartheid state is self-hating, then we have to include on that list former Mossad head Mayor Dagan, former Prime Minister Ehud Barak, and former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, because all of them have suggested that Israel... Now just a second. Just a second. Even, even if that is correct. Just a second. Even if that is correct. I, I, I'm happy to say what correct. I think. Even I'm, if that I'm happy to say what I think. But no, I, I'm no, just no. saying, as a matter of fact, <laughs> go home and Google. <laughs> even, Peter, even if that is oh, correct. Okay. Even if that's cloud says that Oud Barak. It is let's correct. Say, let's say Oud Barak is like this. Let's say Oud Barak. I have no respect for Oud Barak. If you wanted to include it, if you say that Mayor Dagan and Oud Barak and whatever you name also. And Olmert. Are on yeah. Olmert, OK? Yeah. Edgar Braun from Zeta too. Go you you find yourself a very righteous man, Oud Olmert. <laughs> I mean, if you say no, he that. he may be a crook, just, I don't just, think just he's a second, just, a, Jew. just a second. Just, I didn't finish. Yeah. I didn't finish. If you say that they say, and you claim, that Israel is an apartheid state, I don't care who says it. Be it whoever it is. Be it the chief rabbi of Israel. I don't care. This does not take it away from it. Is Israel an apartheid state? That's bullshit. Okay, but that's self-hating, that's idiotic to say. Okay, you have you, no you're, idea you're, what apartheid is. But you're changing. You have no clue. Now you're no, 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 I'm not, you're changing your argument. No, here. I'm not changing. You, now no, you're saying it's no, factually incorrect. No. Two of you, you got to let me speak. Now you're saying it's factually incorrect. I happen to agree it's factually incorrect. But you earlier said that anyone, as one of your examples, I said, what defines somebody as being a self-hating Jew? And your example, among others, was people who say that Israel could be an apartheid state. So I give you some examples yes, of people, and you clearly don't think they're self-hating Jews, right? So 
no, 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 no. The problem is this promiscuous way of talking, right? No, 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 no. I mean, Peter, you make no sense. You make no logic. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. All I say to you, if people say, the Jews who come and say that Israel is an apartheid state, that the IDF is SS, they are self hating Jews. That's what I said. They are anti Semites, Jewish anti Semites. That's what I said. I don't care who said it. Don't give me names. I don't care who Okay, so they are anti they are anti Semites. They are anti Semites. If this is what okay. they say, they are anti Semites. Okay. Period. Okay. All right. So 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 Merit Gan is an anti Semite. Okay. Um, yes. uh, the, the the I think it was interesting the um the I think the, on the question of um whether Jews should care about uh, racism towards African Americans, right? You, you, see, you were concerned, it seemed to me, that the people in the Minnesota were not Look, focused on anti-Semitism, but they were talking about racism, right? I, I, I think I have to explain to you better, okay. because obviously you didn't understand it. Uh, do I care about racism in America? But you seem to just... Yeah, Peter, you, let, yeah let, you do. Peter, let me answer. Do I care about racism in America? Damn, I do. Damn, I do. If you read the book, Yes, I, did. I mean, this is the this is one of I, I probably one of the people who care most about racism in America. I put America so down because of what I, I have seen I know, I in read. this country. Just the people might not know, so I have to tell them too. Okay, tell what me. I have seen in this country, what I have seen in this country in the hood. That's unspeakable. It's unbelievable that something like this exists in our day and time. When refugee camps that we have been to. Easy and me and, and other people in our video calls, we have been refugee camps in the Middle East. Frightening places that when you, you leave, you cry. I did. Those places were plaza hotels, five star hotels, compared to the wood in America. And I put down, I really, really don't like the racism here in America. And I charge American and I blame America for unbelievable anti racism on all fronts, especially the ones who should never be anti-racist, uh, and people like the Democrats who don't care shit, I'm sorry to say, about blacks in this country. Of course I'm against anti-Semitism. Of course I am. You don't have to be Jew to be against racism. I'm not blaming that. I'm not saying that. But all I'm saying is, if you are in a temple, and all you care is about something, you know, called racism, about this guy, who has nothing to do with Judaism, who did a despicable act, the murderous act of killing innocent people in the church, you know, and months after that, and you make a meeting about that, you never make a meeting about yourself, about what happens to Judaism. I mean, I, ex I expect a group to care about itself first. But don't, not only they don't care about themselves, all they care about is, yes, they care about blacks, they say they care about blacks, but again, it boils down to what do they care about? Palestinians. So we don't actually know that these Jews in Minnesota don't also hold meetings to show their concern for anti-Semitism, right? It just it happens that the one meeting you went to was not about that, which is okay. No, you but, don't get uh, it. And don't so, get, you don't so, get sorry, it. Sorry, no. Sorry, Julia, you no, keep no, interrupting no. me, my friend. Of, of course, so, of so course. So why don't you let me because, finish? Because yeah, you, you, you're, you're summing up what I said in the wrong no, way. No, no, because this, I'm you're trying to make the point that the entire the, book is made up of specific anecdotes from which you draw unbelievably global conclusions. Like, if you didn't see it, it doesn't exist, no, right? You, you, so, you as it happens, to me, let me finish, my friend. No. Let me finish, because no, you've spoken finish. a lot more than I have. As it happens, these American I Jews, the these American Jews, ah, there we go, these American <laughs> Jews who don't care at all about themselves, right, uh, only care about helping the uh, other people who don't give a shit about them, right? Happen to have created actually a very powerful political infrastructure, right? Which has a pretty significant impact on American policy, right? That they that is response that they are doing that from the perspective of Jewish self-interest, right? We can agree disagree about whether what APAC and the federations all these things are doing is good, but the point is the idea that American Jews never take Jewish self-interest into their account. Right? It makes no sense. But we would not have the institutional infrastructure we have, which lobbies the American government on what American Jews perceive to be the protection of Jews, right? If it were not for Jews being concerned about self-interest. So American Jews are quite concerned okay. about their self-interest. I heard you. Now, my point is again, they talked only about the blacks, and when they talked about themselves, this is the example. There are many examples. Don't say I can include, I think. I want to I spoke to thousands of people. You know, within seven months around the United States, day and night, 14, 16 hours a day, just talking to people, seven days a week. You know, I didn't like take five examples and put it there and made a conclusion. No, I didn't do that. Yeah, you did. And the example, what? 
Yeah, you pretty much did. No. Go ahead. No. I mean, because no, there's no, no data in the book. I mean, no, there's no, no sorry, data. I, I, can, I cannot put the book in a volume. If I had to put everything, I have to put, like, a volumes of writings. Mm. You know, you cannot do that. You take examples. You cannot do everything. But believe you me, this is what you are accusing me is totally wrong. It's baseless. <laughs> and, and Jeffrey Goldberg is probably right. You don't care about reality, about facts. <laughs> okay, but let's... And Jeffrey Goldberg is not, it's not, a, it's not a, you know... Uh, no, can I say something about, about African-Americans and, and racism and Jews? That's a second. That's a second. Let me, let me, let's finish this. The point is, you want to make a meeting about blacks? Okay. You want to make a meeting about racism? It's okay with me. What was not okay with me, it was supposed to be the meeting about racism. You have it. But then you mixed with it, in my view, self-hating by calling Israel all kinds of bad names. This is not the issue. Right. I mean, actually, as it happens, we have a lot of American Jewish issues, a lot of American Jewish organizations, the Anti-Defamation League, for instance, uh, uh, a lot of the federations, the Jewish Community Relations Councils, that actually don't really criticize Israel, but they focus a lot on being critical of American policy when it comes to do with African Americans and immigrants and uh, LGBT. So actually, we have a lot of Jewish organizations that do exactly what you say American Jews don't do, right? I think it's, I think it's important to try to understand why it is that um, uh, uh, you, you make this you make this point you made this point that and you say it in the book a whole bunch of times that we you you know that Democrats in you know there are tens if not hundreds of millions of them um, uh, many of whom are African Americans because African Americans are the Democrats' most loyal constituency and Barack Obama couldn't give a shit about Democrat about African Americans you say that again and again right you know Barack Obama doesn't care about African Americans and you just said that you know Democrats don't care about African Americans right. Okay. So then why are African Americans so stupid that in every single election they vote for Democrats at, 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 at rates of over 90 or 95 percent? Why is it that people, poor people, okay, in the middle of America vote for Republicans who say they are going to take their health care from them? That's an issue that's nothing to do with that. What you're saying, you're you are really mixing things. That nothing to do. Why do blacks do that? And why, do, why do the poor of, of, of Kansas vote Republicans and they know they are going to take away from them the affordable... Uh, they actually, uh, the, actually don't. Of course, they're they not stupid. I'm no, sorry. No, poor okay. people tend to vote Democratic. No, poor, poor people... No, I'm sorry. In, in the middle of the, of the country, there's a lot of poor if people... If you only look at white people, okay. it's true. Okay. It's true. But if, okay. you look at the, if, you look at, if you look at income course, in I'm general, you see the Hillary Clinton won people I'm who made less than $50,000 a year. I'm, in, I'm talking about the poor whites. Okay, okay. In, any, in any case, yes, I mean, you, you mentioned ADL. I mean, AD, I would rather close down ADL with Mr. Greenblatt over there. You know, I don't need it. I don't need this Jewish... Many of these Jewish organizations, you know, they do okay. nothing. Nobody elected them. Who elected these people? They talk in our names. There are five and a half million Jews in this country or something like that. They talk in our name. Nobody elected them. They are just God knows how they got there. And Mr. Greenblatt, I, I, I would rather he share an Islamic... Uh, Organization of the Jewish. <laughs> okay, let's continue. Uh, let let's me just continue. say one thing about, about about what Barack Obama has done for African Americans. I just think one specific thing again, because I think a little bit of data is important, right? They're about as a result. Just a second, just a second, sorry, just a second, sorry. Just a because of because of the Affordable Care Act, let's, let's seven go. million more African Americans are eligible for health insurance. That's all I'm saying. Go ahead. Okay, continue. By the way, I think that personally, me, mm -hmm. I think there should be. I, I'm also I'm li also living in Germany. And the moment I got my green card, whatever it is, I got universal care, and I'm, I'm right. not for affordable care. Act. I think universal care. Right. And which party I think the richest, supports that? I, I think that the richest country. I think Obama could have done it when he was a president. The first year he was a god, everybody did it, and he didn't want to do it. Why? Because there is something in the Democrats. They want the poor to stay poor so they can vote for them again. <laughs> okay. All right. He actually did it in his second year. Go ahead. Okay, continue. The University of California, Berkeley. Here's what I read in the San Francisco Business Times. UC Berkeley launches Saudi-funded philanthropy university. Say what? A little explanation follows. University of California, Berkeley, and its Haas School of Business are launching an online philanthropy university to help folks in the nonprofit realm with finance, fundraising, strategy, leadership, and other challenges. As far as I know, Saudis, they're interested in charity as much as I'm interested in forestry. But life offers its surprises, and maybe one day I will discover an interest in forestry. It's early afternoon when I arrive at the campus. Oh my God, what I see. An endless stream of people moving around countless small tables. 
Everybody trying to convince everybody else to join this or that particular club. What's happening here, I ask a few students. Tabling, they answer. Berkeley, they explain, has about 1,500 different clubs, and each club wants members. Some of the clubs are just for fun, such as health clubs, but others are more serious. The Muslim Student Association, Queer Business and Leadership, an atheist club, a bunch of Catholic clubs. Here's one for Palestine, and quite a distance off is a Jewish one. Walking around the students, I notice that almost every second person here is Asian. As for blacks, there are very, very few. You can hardly see them here. I keep walking. Here are some Jewish students. Berkeley has the largest number of Nobel laureates of any university, they share with me, and it's an honor to study here. How does it feel to be Jewish here? It's not easy, one of them says. What do you mean? For me, it's tough because Israel is important for me, and most Berkeley students are pro-Palestinian. When I share positive thoughts about Israel, they move a distance from me. But for most Jewish students here, either those who don't get involved in politics or those who are pro-Palestine, it's OK. Some Jewish students I hear don't get politically involved for fear that they will be viewed badly by other students. How are the professors, I ask a young lady. Nine out of 10 are against Israel and for the Palestinians. Do you regret choosing this university? No, Berkeley's a great university. If you had children, would you advise them to study here? Yes! I can't say that I fully understand her. To get a better grasp of this prestigious university, I go to chat with the boss of all bosses, Nicholas Dirks, who is UC Berkeley's chancellor. Nicholas Dirks, as his name implies, is of German descent. Do you have German characteristics, I ask him. How would you characterize German? Whatever people say about them, you know. Exactness, honesty, a little racist. Sitting by Nicholas is Berkeley's spokesperson, an American Jew by the name of Dan. And this American Jew bursts into loud laughter when he hears this. Nicholas laughs as well and says, I don't want to go there, you know. This can only get me in trouble. It's great if you get in trouble, at least for me. Yeah, and I get fired. As the laughter subsides, Nicholas says, I am obsessively punctual. Are you also direct with people, telling them exactly what you think? Yes. Am I fat or not? You are not fat at all. You could use a little more exercise, but that's true for all of us. <laughs> laughter again. And when this subsides, I move on. Yesterday, at the tabling, it seemed to me that about half of UC Berkeley students are Asian. Is that really so? What's the percentage of Asian students at Berkeley? Close to 40%, Dan interrupts. Asians are the single largest group. What's the number for blacks? I ask Nicholas, ignoring Dan. 3%, says Nicholas. How come Berkeley has so many Asians and so few blacks? This morning, we announced a new African-American initiative, and one of our hopes is to dramatically increase the percentage of African-American students in our student body. Just this morning? Did you announce it in my honor? Yes, absolutely. It's for you. Let me ask you. Berkeley is known, at least in some circles, as being very much anti-Israel. Is this true? Actually, I don't quite know where that impression came about. You know that such an impression exists. I don't hear many complaints from Jewish students about that. I spoke with some Jewish students, and I was told that it's tough here. Some Jewish students even told me they don't get involved politically on campus because they don't want to be singled out by other students. Are you aware of any of this? No, he replies, and then immediately corrects himself. I am aware of some of it, but... We have reached out to Jewish students, and we want to make sure that they get involved as they wish to. We have done a survey, in fact, across the Jewish student community, and we've found that there's a high level of satisfaction with their life at Berkeley. I know nothing about Berkeley. What I said now to you is what the students said to me. They said, for example, that in their estimate, nine out of 10 professors are against Israel. It is at this point that Dan, the Jew, interrupts me. 
he is upset that I raised the issue. Had, uh, had he known that I would raise this issue, he would have made sure that I would not be sitting here now with the chancellor. Before I leave, Dan tells me that he'd like to talk with me in private. We sit down for a little talk, and Dan says that according to a survey done by the university, 90% of the Jewish students say that they feel welcome and respected on this campus. If this is true, this is the first time in 4,000 years that 90% of Jews agree on any given topic. <laughs> Hawaii. Hawaii is at its most stunning outside the tourist areas. I drive for days on the island of Oahu and can't get enough of its beauty. But it's not until my last evening in Hawaii that I get a fuller, much more realistic picture of life in this state. A local resident, who happens to be an Orthodox Jew, asks me if I'd like to go with him on a ride away from the Japanese buyers and far from the island's diamond perfumes to see the real face of Honolulu. It's going to be tough, he says. Let's go, I say. Orthodox Jews, unlike most of their non-Orthodox brethren, are people who are proud of being Jewish, and they have enough room in their psyches to care about other people as well. Not that all Orthodox Jews care, just as it wouldn't be true to say that all non-Orthodox don't care, but those who care among the Orthodox don't just pay lip service when they talk of those who are less fortunate than themselves. They don't have to play this game because they don't care what other people think of them to start with. For them, poor does not mean some Palestinian out there on the other side of the planet, but real poor living next to them. We drive in the direction of the non-Palestinian poor of Hawaii. It's a ride in hell. The hellish sight is a city within a city, a state within a state, a reality within a reality. It's called an encampment. This encampment, my guide tells me, is just one of a number of encampments in Hawaii. What's an encampment? I let my eyes answer. Lines of tents, one after another, on both sides of the road, packed with people who have no home, no address, no future, and hardly a life. Here are the voiceless and the forgotten, American citizens, seniors and infants, men and women, all members of the Red Zone Society of America. I make my acquaintance with some of them, and they break my heart. Here are little kids, and here are old people. Some are less than one year of age, and some are quite old, but all are deep into homelessness, and most will likely never get out of it. The current American president, who was raised on this island and loves to vacation in it, did not come to the world the way these kids did. He went to a private school in a nice part of town, while these kids go to no school. Their school, so to speak, is a life amidst piles of garbage. Here's a man born in American Samoa who identifies himself as Mad Dog. I ask him to explain to me what my eyes see, but he tells me what they don't. No white people here. Whites, he tells me, don't even pass by here. And if they happened to pass by for whatever reason, they don't stop to chat. Mad Dog is touched by the simple act of my standing next to him, touching him shaking his hand and wanting to hear him out. I'm not a homeless, he says, with the little pride that is still in him. I am a houseless. First and foremost, he faults himself. Pointing at a bottle of beer from which he drinks, he says, I wouldn't be here if not for this. How much do you drink? Two packs of 18. 36 bottles a day. How do you get the money for it? And how can you drink so much? Emotionally taken by the mere fact that I show interest in him and his life, he tells me his story. For starters, he got out of prison just recently in Oklahoma. 
To make a long story short, the authorities in Hawaii prefer to save money on imprisoned people, and they contract out-of-state private prison companies, yes, those exist in America, to host their prisoners. The way this works is very interesting. When a man or a woman gets a prison term, the authorities dress him up nicely, put him on a commercial plane, and fly him to a prison of their choice, depending on which private prison they have a contract with, and the prisoner serves his time there. When he's released, the authorities dress him nicely once more and fly him back. The private prison business, by the way, is one of the fastest growing businesses in the country. What crime did you commit? Selling dope. You served your sentence and you are back in Hawaii. Are you back into selling dope? You drink beer with me, huh? I will. He gives me a bottle. There are between 500 and 1,000 people living in tents from Alamoana Boulevard to the ocean and the Jabsom Medical School nearby depending on how many the authorities have been able to kick out of here in the last sweep. Yes, they do this here. From time to time, the authorities, who want to make sure that no tourist encounters the poor, come and make a sweep, during which they push the people out and sweep their tents away. Number of children here today, between 50 and 70. Mad Dog spends an awful lot on beer, but he doesn't drink by himself. He gives free bottles to others in this encampment, as he has just done with me. Are you pr a proud American, I ask Mad Dog? I love America, but I'm not proud to be an American. In America, you can be the biggest criminal, but you will be acquitted in court if you have money for a good lawyer. Are you happy that Barack Obama is America's president? I'm happy that a brown man made it to be a president. Do you think he cares about you? Somehow, I don't know why, this question touches a chord in him. He doesn't talk. He pauses. He looks around, up, and then at me. You honored me by being here, and I won't lie to you, he says before answering this last question. And then he does. That motherfucker doesn't care a fuck about me. Mad Dog's wife comes by and pats him on his shoulders. She loves him. I look at them and at the little kids strolling by. I want to cry. I hug the man as tight as I can, and I leave. Thank you very much. If I understand correctly, Peter, you support uh, BDS against the settlements, correct? Uh, only against settlements, not against Israel. Yeah, this, that, that's right, exactly. Yeah. You support. Right. I think you should start a BDS against America because look what they, they annexed Hawaii. That's true, there's a difference, though. Uh, yeah. The, like the, the difference is that in Hawaii, yeah. people, have, people all have the right to vote, and they're all, they can all become citizens. Okay, well, we'll get to this. We'll get to this. America also but took over all of Mexico, the, too, okay. right? Texas, okay. Arizona, New Mexico. Okay. 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 They're all, California, all, okay. we took okay. it all from Mexico. Okay. But by the end of the day, before the right to vote, before we go there, yeah. there was annexation. They took out their pride. There was a kingdom of Hawaii. Even in, in the resolution of the Congress, when Bill Clinton was the president, you know, I think unanimously they, they voted that it was basically in other words, illegal. So this is a crime done by the United States of America. Not just in Hawaii, the what? entire of the United States no, of America. No, what? The that? entire of the United States of America was yeah, Atlantic. Not just, why not just Hawaii? The entire of, of course, the United of States course, of America. Of course, of course, no question about it. Right. No question about it, the entire United States of America. So that's one of the examples that I have, you know, when you talk about what Israel is doing for purpose of basically keeping itself alive, surrounded by animals that want to kill it. Look what happens in Jerusalem today. L they still don't want to go to al to pray. Um, and what happens in America? America did not have to do it. America did not need. America did not, in any shape or form, need a why. But they did it, and it is illegal, and we don't talk about it. But we talked about Israel. We're talking about us with American passports, with American citizenship, you know, we have also to remember how bad we are as Americans, not Jews. I I'm agree. Just against the, I, I, 
I assume I, I, I hope you agreed with me. And that's one of the points that I want to raise, and that's why I brought these things. And the other reason why I brought this chapter is because our why is only democratic. Everything is democratic there. You know, the senators, governor, whatever you call it, everybody, congressmen, you know, are democratic. And the way they treat the poor over there, for me, it was shocking, it was frightening, and it goes against everything I thought about what Democrats are and should be, at least. Mm -hmm. At least my, my understanding of it. And that's the reason I brought about it, and that's the reason I talked about, you know, about the Democrats, when they have the power, and they can do, they should have done much better. Right. You know? I, I, look, I think, first of all, I, I liked what you wrote about Hawaii. I think that you, you wrote about something that most people and most Americans don't know or think much about, and I think that's very important. Uh, I also think that Democrats are not saints, right? Um, of course they're not saints. Uh, the reasons for the, uh, the reasons that life is so brutal for poor people in the United States, and especially for people of color, go reach deep into American history, right? So, for instance, you spend a lot of time, to your credit, you go into African-American neighborhoods and you see how ravaged they are, right? Yeah. So there's a history to this, right? Mm -hmm. A large part of the reason that this exists is that the reason, the way that white Americans acquired wealth was through home ownership especially after World War II, they were benefited enormously by things like the GI Bill and the Federal Housing Authority that made it relatively easy for them to get mortgages with a small amount of money down and then get a house that would appreciate over time. And that's for most Americans, that's their greatest asset. African Americans were essentially barred from that process. They could not take advantage of, cheap, of the loans that the federal government was offering in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. That is a big part of the structural reason that you have this massive wealth gap that you were seeing the consequences of. So good for you for talking about it. But it's not true that Barack Obama, who was lots of failings, didn't try to do anything about it. There are a whole series of tangible things that Barack Obama okay. did that are actually did help poor people. The in expansion of the earned income tax credit, for instance. I'm sorry to be a little bit wonky, but basically a negative income tax where if you are working but you are poor, the government sends you a check to working poor people. This is actually something that allows people to make ends meet. Right? The, 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 um, Barack Obama, also you talked about this gentleman and the, lead, the judicial system. Right? Barack Obama and Eric Holder made a very very, very serious effort to reduce sentencing for nonviolent drug offenders, a large numbers of whom were in jail, right? So these are actually things. Okay, so I did African Americans didn't support, didn't go, didn't with the highest turnout ever in, 2000, in 2012 go to vote for Barack Obama because they're idiots. There was some racial pride, but he actually also did tangible things that improved their lives. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go too much about it, but I'll give an example. I mean, there are things that Barack Obama did, and I support these things that you mentioned. I do support what he did. I mean, I, I've never said everything that Barack Obama did is wrong. Totally not correct. So I'm not an anti-Barack Obama person, you know. I just said to you that traveling the country, you know, and I, when I talk to the poorest of the poor blacks, they had the F word for him in all kinds of forms. And that's what pissed me off. I think he should have done much better. But let's leave Barack Obama. What Barack should he Obama, have done? Barack Obama, just Barack Obama. I said, let's leave it. Barack Obama. No, no, no. tell me what he should have Barack done. Barack Obama. I am not a president. I don't know how to deal with these issues. So I don't run for president, and I don't say I will help you if I don't know how to help you. And in any case, time moves on. And my favorite part of, uh, of events like this is the Q&A with you. You have to be very precise when you talk about Gil Barak, for instance. He never said it's an apartheid state. He said the following. Gil Barak, Israel's defense minister, last night delivered an unusual blunt warning to his country that the failure to make peace with the Palestinians would leave either a state with no Jewish money majority or an apartheid regime. I said, I said, I said, sorry, excuse me, sir. I said they all warned that Israel could become an apartheid state if the occupation became permanent. I do not believe Israel is an apartheid state. And I've written that repeatedly. I do believe that Ehud Barak and Ehud Omer and Mayor Dagan are not self-haters because they warn that the possibility of a permanent occupation over millions of people who are not citizens in the state that controls their lives is a grave threat to Israeli democracy which is the point they were making. Uh, just a question. If, uh, are you okay with annexation of Jerusalem? Am I okay with the annexation of Jerusalem? 
Do you, you what, first of all, how you mean annex, annexing all of all of East Jerusalem? And I'm, they're doing what with the Palestinian I'm not, population? I'm not, I'm not talking about Abu Dis. I'm not talking about Kalandi. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking basically about you know the real Jerusalem, which is with. You're talking about the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem. I'm, I'm talking about you know the East Jerusalem that part of the old city. Put it this way. Are you okay with annexation of the old city? Are of you going and, and and what are you going to do with the Palestinians who are in East them, Jerusalem? Are you going to give, give them citizenship? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't. They uh, they don't have citizenship. They're permanent residents. Sorry, sorry. Yes. They're permanent. Just, just, they're they're permanent. Let, let me ask. They're let permanent, me ask. They're, res, they're permanent let, let residents of the city of Jerusalem. Okay. They're not citizens. Let, let me ask. You. Are you okay with giving them total citizenship? Are you okay with an connection? Just for the record, are you okay with an annexing would, Jerusalem? It, it, with giving them passports and the right to vote? Yes or no? Uh, well, I would annex all. I would, in a peace agreement, I would annex all of the Israeli neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, perhaps with the exception of. Uh, the Jewish neighborhoods, perhaps with the exception of Har Homa, and the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, I would make the capital of a Palestinian state. Just let's second, remember, just, let's remember that, there, that the, the, the separation Peter, of Peter, 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 No, I didn't understand your answer. You can't speak, keep speaking over me. No, no, You've got to let me finish, No, 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 no I asked you, you one question. You've spoken more than I no, no, have. Peter, Peter. Sylvia, be a man. Let me Peter, finish. I will be a man. Let me finish. Okay, let me finish. I'm going to finish. Peter, I'm going to finish. Peter, I'm asking you one question. The old city of Jerusalem, I'm not talking about Har Homa. I'm not within the Homa borders. Oh, you're talking about the old city. Exactly, that's what I asked you. The municipal boundaries of East Jerusalem are vastly larger than the old city. Right? That's why Israel, I asked you. When Israel uh, that's took why over, I asked let you. me finish. When Israel took over the when Israel took over Jerusalem in 1967, it expanded the municipal boundaries of East Jerusalem about tenfold. And it took in many many this is villages. Not what I asked it took you, in Peter. many many East Jerusalem. Peter, Peter, you know this is what I asked you. I said to you, not Kalandia, not Abu Dis, not any of them. I said just the old city. I the, I would have much? Jewish yes, I would have Jewish sovereignty over most of the old city and on the Temple Mount, I would have, this was what Clinton proposed in the Clinton parameters, I would, there would be an international consortium including I, the United just States on, just, second, just on Temple Mount. that would oversee, just that would oversee those small holy sites. Yeah. Okay, just realize, but the rest of the old city, I'm talking about the old city, uh, the, 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 the old city is a, is a very small place. I can't say that I would in, would would, the entire old question. city. But I would certainly, the areas where Jews live in the old city, yes. No, there are Palestinians living there too. Yes. Uh, yes the question is, giving the Palestinians the right, you know, the, Passports. I'm just asking. Just the old city, not the definition of the of Jerusalem being like I, I don't know what. Just the old city. Uh, yes. No. The, the, no. 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 The issue. The issue is. That's my I wouldn't. I don't know the exact. I don't know if I would annex every corner of the old city. I would annex the areas of the old city where Jews live. The areas that are overwhelmingly Palestinian. I'm not sure. The the holy sites. There was a lot of work done on this okay. in the Clinton parameters. Would be put under a kind of international consortium to make sure that the okay. religious rights. I'm not talking about the Laksa. Again, I'm but not I talking just about the Laksa. When people I'm, talk about Jerusalem. When people are not, we are not talking about one people. About, Peter. We're talking about hu there are huge swaths of Jerusalem. The separation barrier cuts through the municipal borders of Jerusalem, leaving 100,000 Palestinians who are residents Peter. of Jerusalem on the other side. Peter, right? this is not what I asked you. I asked you again. I'm not, I don't want to talk about all the other parts. I, I said specifically. Right. Specifically, my question was. And my answer is, I, my answer is, I would annex part of the old city. I can't say I would annex the entire old city. Okay, that's the answer. Okay, thank you. Which does not make sense because you said before that if you give them citizenship, it's okay with you. No, the question like, is... Like in Hawaii. What? Like in Hawaii. No, you I actually... like in Hawaii. Well, you said in Hawaii, it's okay yeah. because you're going to... So because why I not... Actually, annex, just, because let me, let, I'm a Zionist. Let, let, let me, fin let oh, me yeah, just finish the question. Where you're going. Of the old, I'm talking about the old, all this is Jerusalem, okay? It's Jerusalem, whatever it is. I'm talking just this, the old city. Right. There are Arabs there, living there. Right. The same... And Jews, of course. Right. You said that Hawaiian annexation is okay because they gave them citizenship. I say we are going to give the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem in this part, for God's sake. Right, but right, and I, why, if, you, if why, you're going to annex the, if you're going to annex the area, you should give them citizenship. But it's also but important. It okay? It's a, because this is a negotiation between two sides. It's also important to have an understanding of what okay. the Palestinians okay. want as well, right? Okay, most makes no Palestinians, sense. Like, no sense. Most Palestinians do not want. Sorry, okay, let me finish, ma'am. Mo and then you're welcome to talk as like long. Most Palestinians, as of now, do not want Israeli citizenship. They would prefer citizenship in a Palestinian state. And the same thing goes for the people of the Y. Which you accept no, that the most people, people of Hawaii. Most people in Hawaii do not want to return to an uh, No, at that kingdom. time, they before, want to be before it was annexed, before it was annexed, they didn't want to do it. It was a kingdom, then, and they didn't want America there. Yeah, and if you no. want to talk about reparations just, for the people of Hawaii, no, I'm not, entirely not, open not, to not, that. Not, I'm not talking about reparations. And it's interesting to me. It you, was okay for you to annex Taiwan. Let me ask you a question. Oh. Let me ask you a question. Look what happened. Let me ask you a question. Should, we, should, we, rem should we remember? Should we remember what the United States did to the people of Hawaii? 
so if we can, if we should remember that, why shouldn't we also remember the Nakba? Even as we celebrate Israel's, we celebrate Benny Morris himself. Benny, the, it's it's Israeli. Sorry, it's Israeli. It's Israeli historians working from Israeli archives who have documented to the fact that the creation of the state of Israel, which is a tremendous blessing to the Jewish people, and why I'm a Zionist. No, he didn't take any of it back. He changed his, the political conclusions. He's a right winger now, but the documentary evidence, which was that you know. 700,000, 800,000 people, whatever, left their homes, many of them because they were fearful. That's documented not by Israeli historians working out of the Israeli archives. So why, if we're going to remember, sorry, let me finish. If we're going to, no, no, actually, that's, no, that's actually no serious Israeli historians believe that anymore because even right-wing Israeli historians, sorry, Ben, Benny, Benny Morris, Benny Morris demolished that with Israeli archives. So if we can remember, stop, stop, stop. Stop a second, if we can remember, stop a second. If we can remember what happened to Hawaii, we can also okay, remember okay, what okay. happened to Palestine. Okay, 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 stop, stop. Next question. Okay. The question was how many people were killed by American army in Iraq? Right. And civilians. Right. right. Significant number. So the vast majority of time when I go on TV, it's not to discuss Israel. Most of my most of my columns, all my columns in Atlantic, are not about Israel. I wrote an enormous amount about the Iraq War. I literally, my second book was entirely inspired by trying to understand the experience of the Iraq War, which had an ext extremely important effect on me personally. And just because like, as it happened, my I, sister I, I, I'll all fought in it. I'll corroborate one thing. I mean, uh, Peter. Yeah. Peter Beinart initially. Mm. I supported the Iraq War. That's why I wrote. Peter, Peter, that's Peter, why I wrote the book. Peter, I'm, 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 I'm saying it for you now. Yeah. Initially, Peter Beinart, Peter supported the Iraq War. I did. Um, and then he went back on it. Was, I changed my mind. He was yeah. a very strong supporter. And just for the record, I did not support it from the beginning. Good I for you. I thought it was the most stupid thing to invade Iraq. I thought it was the murder of civilians murder from the kinds that I read. I don't know how accurate it is. Under 1050. 150,000 Iraqis lost their lives under invasion for no reason other than show that we are powerful. Okay. And that's, that's... I'm not sure that's, I would entirely say that, so but I'm you were right, happy, you were so right to oppose happy, the war. So I'm very happy that you... You were right to oppose the war. I'm very, I'm very happy that you changed your mind after that. Yeah. Yeah, right. The question was, do so, you think you have the right. moral right... Does an American have the right to criticize, to criticize Israel? Israel? To criticize Israel. Any right. American so to criticize if Israel? Ameri if I, I, I think we agree... We agree that America's that America has committed very serious crimes, right? So then the question is, if we as an America don't, because of our crimes, don't have the moral right to criticize Israel, then how do we have the moral right to criticize the Palestinians? How do we have the moral right to criticize the Iranians? By that standard, we don't have the moral right to criticize anyone who doesn't exist in our country, right? So by that, so then Americans, we should shut up about Iran and we should shut up about the Palestinians because we don't live there and our country has done bad things. That's the logic. So okay. we should have no moral opinions about anything that doesn't happen in our country. Okay, just a second, just a second. Let, let me, that, let, I don't think that logic let me give makes a sense. Let me give a different answer yeah. to this question. I think that Americans have no moral right, and same for Europe goes, to criticize Israel. They have been killing millions upon millions of people. They use the flag of human rights only with, when it fits their agenda. Other than that, they kill mercilessly including this country, the United States of America. I mean, don't, don't talk about Iraq. What happened in Libya? We have no numbers about Libya. United States dropped Tamwak missiles on Libya, hundreds of Tamwak missiles. Each one of them cost a million and a half dollars. So I asked the press office of the American Air Force, how many were killed? They said each one of them can kill about 10,000. I said, we don't have the right information, correct? She said, no, because nobody is asking us the question, the media. I say, well, I am media. And she says, okay, goodbye, I cannot answer anymore. <laughs> Wait, just a second. I, mean, I mean, we have no rights. We, as Americans, forget Jews. And what's funny, and this is what I'm talking about, this is what I tried to explain to you before. What's funny about it is like, you know, we go around, you know, Shamnu Bagadnu about, you know, one Palestinian got killed because of us, and at the same time, everybody is killing forever. And how does any, nobody has a moral right. So okay. if we behave, you know, it's rightfully, funny. and by the way, and if we want to criticize everybody, first of all, we have to criticize ourselves. And what happens with American Jews, 
on, on the part that belongs to you. I rarely, if ever, hear them, be it in a temple, be it in, a, in, in an event, criticizing America. Most American Jews, as far as I have seen at least, are very patriotic. No. I don't explain why. I have seen many patriotic ones, even Republican or Democrats. And if we are really talking about against murder of innocence, before we talk about any Palestinians, those who want to kill us, those who have, do not give us right to exist. This is a little country, a pin on the map of the world that we keep damaging and keep damning and keep criticizing over and over. While we live in Europe and the United States, we know the histories of our countries and what our countries are doing, not for any reason of life and death questions you know, or issues like in, like in Israel. America invaded Iraq, not because it, it affected the security of America. America invaded Iraq for God knows what. It started with oil, that we pay less in the, in the gasoline stations, in the gas stations, and then God knows why we started again. 19 Muslims, most of them from Saudi Arabia, 15, whatever, 15 of them from Saudi 15 Arabia, out of 19. To Saudi Arabia, bomb the World Trade Center, and what do we do? We go around and invade Iraq. I want to ask normal America, why do you do that? They said, well, what's the difference? Iraq, Saudi Arabia, it's the same thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's the more compass of people here. Have. Oh, yeah, Syria, Iraq, it's like the same thing. It's like, we like to kill them, why not? OK, let's go to the next question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, OK. So this is exactly what is so disturbing with what Peter does. It's this self-hate. You were quoted in the JT Post after you uh, debated Bokea for saying the Israeli government is reaping what it sowed with Palestinian violence. You were quoted in the J-Post as saying, American foreign policy caused 9-11. You were quoted in the J-Post saying that Elie Wiesel whitewashes bad Jewish behavior. You were quoted in the J-Post saying Hamas isn't so bad, they want a two-state solution. Are these quotes? You want to see the quote yeah. from J-Post? Yeah. No, if you're going to you quote, no, no, I never said Hamas was not so bad. So I, I'm interested in the actual quote of what, I, what you say I said. I'm going to tell you. You didn't say Hamas was not so bad. You're right. You didn't say it. Did you say Elie Wiesel whitewashes bad Jewish behavior? What I wrote was a column about Elie Wiesel. What I wrote started with, with how affected I was by his book, Sages and Dreamers, his book about, about a series of character sketches about people from the prophetic tradition, from the Talmudic tradition, how much I've learned about Judaism, how much I admired, the joy that he's able to take in being a Jew and in Jewish learning, given the horrors of his experience, right? I've read several of his books that had quite a big impact on me. And then I quoted Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg, who was someone the person I really admired, who criticized Elie Wiesel during the first intifada for not speaking out about Israeli human rights abuses. And and I said that even the greatest in our tradition, given our tradition, are subject to criticism. And I criticized Elie Wiesel on specific points that he had made and said that I don't think he's done enough to speak out about the situation, a situation in which, let's just put this, let's just get this down, right? In which millions of Palestinians for 50 years in the West Bank have lived as non-citizens under Israeli control without the right to vote for the government that controls their lives. Without, Puerto sorry, Puerto I'm not, I'm not Puerto done. Puerto sorry, Puerto you don't have, you don't, people, excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, it, this is rude, sir. If you want to explain, explain the difference between the West Bank. The, okay, I'll talk about the difference in Puerto Rico. The difference in Puerto Rico is that the difference in Puerto Rico is that if I move to Puerto Rico, I don't, based on my ethno-religious group, get basic rights that Puerto Ricans don't have. Puerto Ricans can move to, if they're citizens of the United States, can move to another state and then become voting citizens of the United States, right? It's not the same as a, a territory, the West Bank, where Jews are citizens of a state and have the right to vote for the government that controls their lives and have free movement and live under civil law, which means they have due process, and their Palestinians are non-citizens who live under military, who, who live under military law. The, that the Israeli, sorry, sorry, with all due respect, the IDF, the IDF, there's only one state 
that controls the West Bank. Only one military has the right to go into every square corner of the West Bank areas, A, B, and C, at any time it wants, and that is the IDF, right? Israel controls the West Bank. It's true, Israel doesn't want to pick up the garbage in Ramallah, so it subcontracts certain okay, services okay. to the Palestinian Authority. Okay, okay. But the Israel me, controls the West Bank. Okay, let me answer to that. I don't yeah. know about your comments about Ali Wiesel. I don't know what Ali Wiesel said. I don't know this specific thing, but I'm going to answer. I'm just going to at least react to what you say about Israel controlling millions of Palestinians, etc., etc., etc. et cetera. Okay. First of all, had Israel behaved like any normal state in 1967, Israel, when it captured the areas, right. Israel would have done what every other country has done in history. Every other country in history? To you, most every other country in Did history. Did America do that to Japan just in, just in, in, after World War II? Did we do that to West Germany? It's just Peter, a nonsensical Peter, Peter, statement. Peter, 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 let me finish. The point is, like most every other country, if not every other country in history, look what happened. You talk, you talk about World War II. Germany lost about a quarter, qu over a quarter of its, uh, of its territory. And what happened? All the Germans went this way, went to proper Germany and left. That's what it is. That's what happens when you lose a war. You kill the people, you send them away, you do something. That's what you usually do when you lose a war. That's how we create countries. That's how our nation have been built. That's the history. Israel did not do that. That's your did moral standard? Just a second, just a second. Yeah, my moral standards. I, I don't want to have moral standards bigger than the United States. I don't want to have moral standards bigger than Sweden. I don't want to have moral standards bigger than any other country in the world just because I'm a Jew. That's racism by itself. I want to have moral standards. I want to be judged like any other country, like any other human, like any other German, like any other French, like any other Swiss, like any other Norwegian. All these loving people. I want to be judged like them. We didn't do it because we are afraid, because we are stupid, we let them be. Because we're stupid. That's just a second. Yes. Yes. So we should have killed yes. them. Yes. Just a second. Who should have done? Throw them away. I'm sorry. That's what countries do. That's what countries do. Okay. okay? Number one. Number two. Number two. I, I'm just reacting to what you say. Number two. I mean, these people want to kill us. These people don't love us. I personally love the Palestinians. As a person, I studied Arabic. I studied Islam. I studied the Quran. I studied the Hadith. I, I live with them, I lived with them, I enjoy their food, I love their music, look at my, my iPhone, most of the music is Palestinian. I love that music, I love that culture. But it doesn't mean that they don't criticize them. And as all, almost every Palestinian intellectual that he met said to me that people like you don't care for them. You do have to speak Arabic. You do have to know what's going on over there. You do have to know the culture of the people. And we have done that. Stayed with them. Jibril Rajub, the master spy of Palestine, was my best friend. We are buddies. Real, real buddies. And together, after good food, we sit down and eat and laugh at all those American Jews. <laughs> at all those European human rights people. <laughs> Idiots. Wallah. Wallah, you stupid. <laughs> But they help us because they don't like the Jews. <laughs> That's the real story. Next question. Do you think Israel should be a Jewish state? Do I think Israel should be a Jewish state? Yes, but then I have to define what I mean by a Jewish state because Israel doesn't have a constitution in part because it hasn't defined what it means by a Jewish state. So for instance, for me, a Jewish state does not have to have a chief rabbin. I think the chief rabbin has actually been um, something which has been terrible for the evolution of Judaism. So I will tell you how I would define what it means to be a Jewish state, right? So for me, the essence of what it means to have a Jewish state is a state that will provide refuge for Jews in distress. That after the Holocaust, Jews have the right to have one state in the world that has the protection of Jewish life as its mission statement. Uh, and I agree with Tuvia that the sending of the airplanes to pick up the Ethiopian Jews was a perfect example of what I think a Jewish state should be there to do. But I would just say that the, the question of it, so we know, what we need to do, what we need to do is have a debate about what kind of, Jew, what we mean by a Jewish state, because we don't all mean the same thing. So how do you reconcile that with wanting to integrate and give citizenship to people who hate your Jewish state and want to destroy it? 
Okay, so my, my solution, I do not want to give citizenship to the Palestinians in the West Bank, but I believe they deserve citizenship in a country. And that part of the reason I support the existence of a Palestinian state is because I don't think it's immoral to hold pe people for indefinitely, for 50 years, as non-citizens in the state in which they live. And I think the answer to do that while also preserving the possibility of a Jewish state is to support a Palestinian state <laughs> alongside Israel. Now, you also have 20% of Israel's population, I think someone was mentioning, who are Palestinian citizens of Israel. We call them Arab Israelis. Uh, no, actually, if you look at the polling by Sami Smuha, they tend to now more, mostly define themselves as actually Palestinians, and they are from the same actual people. What is a pal? Okay. The, the, the pal okay, I'll tell you what a Palestinian. A Palestinian. A Palestinian is a Palestinian is a, a Palestinian. Sorry, sorry. There was a territory, right, created by the colonial powers, right, after, after World War I, which was called Palestine, right? A national identity, a national identity, a national identity emerged among people who, the Arabs who lived in that territory in the same way that Nigerian identity emerged, or Tanzanian identity emerged, or Indonesian identity. Most third world, sorry, let me finish, most third world nationalisms are a response to colonialism, right? They do not have ancient roots. If, you, if you're going to say that any national group that, does not, that cannot trace its national identity back hundreds of thousands of years is not really a nation, you're basically saying that every nation in Africa and many of the nations in, in, in Asia are not actually nations. What? National identity emerges in response to, to European-drawn boundaries. That's what happened with the Palestinians. OK, very, thank you. Thank you, just, just, just a second. Just a second, just a second. I say, I will say to Peter one thing I would love. I would love to see one day in my life a Palestinian so passionate speaking about the rights of Jews, the way you speak about the rights of Palestinians. I would love, Peter. I would love to see it. Um, uh, next question. We have to leave soon. Next question. Yes. Uh, so, in a joint interview in 1981, uh, both Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat said that the uh, the United States plays a, uh, plays a positive role in the world. So do you both agree? Th this topic came up over and over again. Your opinion about um, the United States. I I, I'll answer in the two begins. Does the United States say a positive world? I mean, to be honest, I f it's, it's, it's harder for me to answer that question in the affirmative under Donald Trump. Um, uh, I think that the United States has been, since World War II, the dominant power in the world, right? Uh, and, 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 the, and in that position, I think the United States has done some truly horrible things. I think the Vietnam War was, was one good example. But the United States has also undergirded, right, a system of liberal democracy and free trade that has actually improved the lives of vast numbers of people. And if you think about what would have been the alternative superpower, right, that we would have rather emerged from World War, World War II as dominant, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, then I think the United, then I think by those standards, yes, we're lucky that the United States, for all its terrible flaws, is a country which is based on law to a degree that its main competitors for superpower dominance in the 20th century were not. Is that okay, your question? My, okay, so it answers the question. I will answer you uh, at this point. Unrel unrelated to uh, at this point, unrelated to Donald Trump, uh, I think that uh, it's not a positive at all, and I'm sorry to say that. Speaking of apartheid, last week, Jews were told by Jordanian authorities, take off your tefillin, right. take off your kippot. They broke into their hotel rooms and told them you will not pray in a Jewish way anywhere in this state. Okay, that's terrible. That What's the question? What's the question? Why do you call Israel by this besmirching libel and slander? What? Yet you don't apply that name to these countries. What? I said specifically that I, I said that is, and I've said this in my writing repeatedly, you can look it up, that I do not think Israel is an apartheid state, and I'll tell you why. I don't think Israel is an apartheid state because inside Israel's original boundaries, Israel gives citizenship and the right to vote to Palestinian citizens of Israel. They live under the same law. So, I, so they don't have the right to vote. No, I'm talking in the West Bank, they he don't have said, the right to vote. But inside Israel's original boundaries, the Green Line, Peter the, 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 the 1949 armistice. Just a, just, a, just a second. Peter, this evening, in the last two hours, Peter did not say that Israel is an apartheid state. I never have. He said, he said, he said the exact opposite. Forget this camp. camp. Forget this camp. But he, did, he said specifically 
He said specifically, I deny, he said, I did not say, I do not say that Israel is an apartheid state, so you cannot blame him for I've saying I've written entire columns Israel. explaining, okay. well, explaining so my point about that. My point is, my point is, no, 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 my, look, my, look, look well. let me, my point is, let me, let me try to, let me try to explain, right? Evenu shalom aleichem, evenu shalom aleichem, I mean, we, we shouldn't fight. The next one. <laughs> Sorry, I want to finish too. Yeah. too yeah. The, the I'm young one. Finish. I'm going to finish. Gonna finish. I'm going to finish. For me, when I, no, no, sir, sir. I think, the bl I think there's blame on both sides. I'll tell you exactly where I think there's blame on both sides. I think, I think the Palestinians' primary blame has been that there is, a deep, there is a deep strand in Palestinian political culture which does not accept the, 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 con the deep connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And that makes it very hard for Palestinian leaders to make peace. I also think Palestinian leaders have undermined their prospects because there's rampant political corruption on both sides of the political leadership, Hamas and Fatah, and it makes it hard for them to have the credibility to ask their people to make the tough compromises they need to make. On the Israeli side, I would say the primary blame that I would apportion for Israel is subsidizing, essentially paying Israelis to move across the Green Line into the West Bank. Because while I can understand that one might argue that, is, that the IDF's presence in the West Bank, that the IDF's presence in the West Bank helps Israeli security. I have never heard a good argument for why civilian settlements in the West Bank enhance Israeli security. In fact, from a security perspective, it makes the life of the IDF much harder to have to defend remote civilian settlements. All and if you believe, as I do, that the three options are one state in which all people have the right to vote, in which you will not have a Jewish state, a Palestinian state, and permanent Israeli control over millions of people who lack basic rights. I think the Palestinian state is the worst option except for the other two, and that we need to maintain that as a possibility, and you undermine that as a possibility when you pay people to move into Israeli settlements and make okay, it harder me, to create a Palestinian okay, okay, state. Okay, 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 let, let me just respond to that. Let me just respond to that for, for one minute, and, and we really have to close. Let me respond to that. I think I, I, I personally, um, I like the settlers. I think they are doing a good job when they are doing there. They believe in the land, they have a pride. For me, this is the most important. Jews who are proud of themselves, proud of their culture, and number one. Number two, we are in the West. In the West, we have this kind of belief or understanding that every solution, every question has an answer. Every problem has a solution. But this is not the case. This is not the Eastern cultures. It has nothing to do with it. In the East, and I'm talking about the Middle East, I'm talking about the Islamic world, look at the Sunnis and the Shias. They have been fighting each other for God knows how long. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be solved. In the Middle East, problems are not to be solved, problems are to stay. Creation of Palestinian states, which de, fa de, de, de facto are already there, the you are not, but it's already a Palestinian state, they call themselves Dulut Palestine, and they are there, but the idea of giving up this land, the, idea, the dream of having peace with the Palestinian is a pipe dream. It's never going to happen. Never, ever, ever. The Palestinians that I met, the most moderate of the moderates, an example, Professor Hanan Ashrawi, told me to my face, told me to my face, and recorded, that there is no proof ever that the Jews ever had a state in that area. And, yeah, I know. And on top of that, she said, when I asked her about had there been a, a Jewish temple in Jerusalem, she said, until archaeologists come and tell her that it existed, as far as she knows, no. No archaeologist, no archaeology ever, no archaeology, how do you call it, uh, archaeology, uh, whatever, <laughs> archaeologist ever said, according to Hanan Ashrawi, that there was a temple in Jerusalem. This is full of bull, but this is what they believe. This is what they believe. And there is nothing, and there is nothing you can do about it. Christ was Palestinian, by the way. 
I will never forget the Palestinians, the, the Palestinians sitting next to, sitting next, sitting next to, standing next to 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 to, to a statue of of Christ of Jesus Christ, and she says to me, "Look at him and me. We are so similar, same family. Look at our eyes. You see the eyes." His eyes and my eyes are the same, same nose, you see, same lips. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I was sitting with a Palestinian the other day, and he says to me, Palestine was funded 14,000 years ago. And I look at him and I said, you infidel, how can you say something like this? He says, what's your problem? I said, Palestine was funded, every kid knows, 30,000 years ago. He looks at me and he says, Wallah, you are right. <laughs> in Palestinian culture, you say something, the moment it comes out of your lips, it's a reality. Can you make peace with people like that? No. Can you make love with them? Oh, baby, yes. Can you enjoy the food? Oh, baby, yes. Can you have a good time with them? Yeah, I do. Bet yeah. You know? But peace, dividing estates, no. The problem is it's just impossible. God bless America, God bless Israel, God bless you, and have a wonderful time. Peter, thank you so very much for contributing your time here. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.